very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here for uh, several reasons. Number one, it's good to see my friends, Hermann Herzberger and others who are here in the audience. And uh, the theme of this IDESM uh, seminar work session seems very important to me as well. But beyond all of it, uh, what I'm interested in is when so many young and uh, inspired architects from all over the world get together to discuss a theme and to think and to dream and to build, uh, I'm interested in it. Uh, I'm interested in, and I was interrogating my hosts here as to what exactly is going on and, and, and how things are developing. But certainly when I read uh, the invitation, uh, and, and I was asked to speak about the museum, but in the, in, in the original invitation, uh, the statement of exploring the dark lands, uh, speaking about the background of basics against which uh, nature rules supreme. I thought about, you know, what is really the most supreme remoteness? Is it the Sahara? Is it, uh, is it the, the jungles? Is it the icebergs floating in the oceans? And I thought, no, uh, that's not the most remote, uh, incomprehensible thing for architects. Uh, the most incomprehensible and remote things about exploring the, dark, the darkness, darklands, uh, that which is desolate, not cultivated, sparsely populated by man, I would say is the human soul. And the human soul, which is so close, and at the same time so far, is also, of course, made visible by architects, by city planners, uh, and in the way people live. And also in what they think their life is really about. But then I thought to myself, that would be too easy to simply reduce the nature, the incomprehensible, the immeasurable. Because at the same time that we understand the world, we understand that through this incomprehensibility of the dark land, we also have an intuition as to where it is leading. And I remembered uh, a famous, uh, unforgettable quote from Albert Einstein who said, that what is most incomprehensible to him is that one can comprehend and intuit the cosmic direction. So what is incomprehensible is that the darkness is in fact penetrable, uh, so to speak, by, by light. And one doesn't have to believe in God or be religious or go on some tangent uh, of the drug world to see that there is uh, a possibility of understanding this remoteness. And where is the dark lens uh, of these abandoned or not yet exploited places uh, really coming from? Uh, are these dark lands to be explored uh, really, uh, and I don't speak about this right now, are the dark lands to be explored really just potential of development, a kind of real estate, uh, a real estate proposition for architectural work? or? Is there another dark land uh, which communicates uh, to the remoteness? And uh, I mentioned the, the word human soul, which is not a very popular word today. It's not a word that has any credibility, actually, in a discourse of a university kind. But nevertheless, the experience survives. And I think uh, that experience and the difference which it makes, uh, I would like to communicate to you in my own personal way, uh, in a single project, that I've been pursuing now for many years because architecture is a very, very slow profession. Uh, if you're doing something which is not just commerce and, and money, uh, you get involved in a dark land. Uh, and uh, how incredible that a place like Berlin, Germany, the place of enlightenment, where Moses Mendelssohn came from, where enlightenment really had also a philosophical uh, penetration, how is it that that place in Europe, in the middle of the world, changed into such darkness, obscurity, and re-emerged in a completely unpredictable way in our time? So when I won uh, the competition for the Berlin Museum and the Jewish Museum, in 19, the, the competition was in 88, and it was judged in 89, and now I look at my watch, it's getting later, later, 96, and the museum will open 97, maybe 98. 
no one really knows because the problems are always money and how quickly can a building be built without money. Uh, but uh, I think uh, to this uh, inscription in my passport when I first came to Germany, and it was a very strange experience for me because, of course, what can be darker than a passport? A permission to enter another place. But in this passport was inscribed a very particular thing. It wasn't a permission to work in Germany. It wasn't a permission to you know, be an architect and, and you know, have jobs. It was to do one specific thing as, a, as, yeah, as an architect, as a person, to complete the Durchführung and Planung and Erweiterung of the Berlin Museum with the Jüdisches Museum till it's finished. It was written by a hand at the border. And uh, that was a very poignant, and I speak now personally, a very poignant message uh, coming from an unknown source because it would have been preferable for me had it been just stamped permission to work is granted. Then you can just work. But when something so specific is inscribed, when a passport is uh, commented in this way, that one specific job, of course, now I have a different passport. It's very general, very abstract. I can practice architecture. And I've been living in Germany for many years. But uh, I think this has to do with, uh, with the dark ones. Uh, it has to do with, uh, with permission, permission to do something. And I, I, I only bring this forth to you as architects, young architects, uh, people, that the dark lands cannot be entered without permission. Uh, you know, even to enter the waters of, uh, of the ocean, one needs some form of permission. There must be an entry point, uh, some sort of an opening from which one has access, and everything depends on the opening. You know, as the old saying says, the way you enter, the way you open, that's the way reality will be fulfilled or not fulfilled. It all depends on that initial and, let's say, a not very clear cipher or mark that has been made somewhere, and usually by someone very specific with a very uh, figurative hole. Uh, and I ask you, really, if, if you're working on the Darklands and on these sites of remoteness, how far they are, and can one bring the remoteness very close to oneself? Because, uh, as I'm trying to say here, that what is the closest, somehow, is that remoteness. And uh, you can have it in your pocket, you can carry it in your, uh, on your body or inside of it, uh, but the physical proximity wouldn't give one an inkling of its flesh, of its materiality. Uh, so that's uh, the flesh, flesh of architecture. It's no bigger, no thicker, no more mysterious uh, than a passport page. Uh, thin, uh, as thin as, and as uh, kind of translucent as a passport page. And I, 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 I took this as a message, uh, it, because it was signed. And uh, then I uh, went to the border many, many times uh, on my passage to and in and out of Berlin. And I always loved, uh, and I, it's kind of a joke, which is a standard joke, but it's true that uh, people were always interested to read this inscription in my passport, and then uh, interrogate me further. Uh, am I finished? Uh, am I finally, you know, finished with this permit? Or do I need to extend it? Uh, but it, it, it's not finishable, because once you have that opening, you, you are, you cannot, finish. When, once you enter the Darklands, and I don't mean just a passport page or the Sahara Desert or an inaccessible remote territory, you cannot leave. There is no exit visa. There's only an entry. And that is something I would like to also uh, tell you about uh, as, as a personal experience uh, of that uh, tangency between desire, dream, possibility, and the reality of the other side uh, because we are not alone. I mean, uh, there's always a passport officer. Or there's always someone who has the permits or does not have the Next one, please. Uh, so, uh, Darkland and remoteness does not necessarily mean uh, design in a kind of like basics. Let's go back to basics. And, and I saw that written in your statement as well, which said, we are bringing design back to basics. And part of the basics 
as you are saying, is the virtual introduction of, quote, mend the measure into the immeasurable spaces. Now, how can I introduce man the measure? What man? Is it man, woman? In what uh, kind of abstract sense is this man the measure? It's, is it Protagoras, a man who is going to be measured? Who, who is to be measured and by whom is the measurement to be done? Uh, so I think the idea of the, the, the measurement of the immeasurable uh, cannot really be done straightforwardly by referring to some sort of a perverse ideological idea of the objectivity of the human body. And we have seen this in, in the world you know, forever. Uh, the, 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 the attempt to reduce the human soul to some meters or some centimeters or millimeters or micromillimeters, uh, whether it's on the one hand a kind of gigantic form hovering in the background coming at us, or whether it is genetic research with its uh, slow but methodical reintroduction of transcendence through control. So, uh, men the measure, uh, reintroducing men the measure is not an innocent act. And uh, I dealt with it when I uh, was given the project of building in Berlin, building uh, the extension to the Berlin Museum and the Jewish Museum. I asked myself, who is the measure of such an operation? Of course, we have to have buildings, we have to have spaces for exhibitions, we have to have cafeterias and all these things. But uh, where is one to take the reference for it? Uh, where, where is one to start? Of course, one can walk around Berlin and, and find uh, the places. But what I really felt strongly, and I continue to do, is that the absence of the measurement and the absence of the measure is the measure itself of the late 20th century and on from it into a kind of unknown because in the 20th century, we, all of us, have learned something that was not uh, known uh, before. And that is the depth of the darkness. I mean, people always knew there was darkness, but they never wanted to deal with it because they knew it was dangerous. Uh, I remember the words of St. Augustine in his essay on education. St. Augustine, who was a Christian theologian, as you know, said, when it comes to the human soul, you should not inquire almost at, at all. Try not to find out more than you already know. Try not to inquire further. Do not look into it. And I said, you know, this is, uh, runs against the grain of men, the measure, finding the immeasurable space and measuring it. Because uh, I think people at that time, and the so-called Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, of, of understood that inquiring just a step further might open up, uh, might open up not just a can of worms and disgusting things coming out, but a kind of indefinite and immeasurable emptiness. Uh, and I looked at this emptiness when I was in Berlin designing the extension to the Jewish Museum, the Berlin Museum, the Jewish Museum, the emptiness that runs across a very vital city and an emptiness which cannot really be filled up by uh, building more buildings. You can build all the buildings you want. You can fill the world with all the volumes and square meters, but you can never fill the emptiness. You can build the material, you can put it on, but one cannot eradicate the emptiness. So one has to take the measure from the immeasurable, which is, after all, what is the basic? Is the name? Is the person? Is the person who was there, whose soul uh, can still be intuited when you walk the empty streets of, uh, you know, where I live on Nolendorf Platz, uh, you walk around, you, you know these apartments, you've read the stories, you, you know, but it's all different. The stones are the same, the windows are the same, the streets are the same, but it's all different. And I tried to find, uh, this is a kind of emblem, I tried to draw a Star of David because I felt I, I wanted to draw it. Uh, coming across uh, east and west, by the way, that's the, the middle thing, that black line, it was the wall. The competition was 1988, the wall was still standing there. But I felt one thing, that when it comes to Jews and to Berliners and to Germans, the wall makes no difference. The east-west uh, division of ideology makes no difference because the one thing that binds Berlin to itself is its relationship to Jews. And uh, I found these points. I looked for them, you know, uh, uh, north and south, east-west. And I found and I tried to find these emblematic, starting with six points uh, and six lines and then 12 points and 12 lines and 36, and you know, kind of multiplying in a Schoenbergian uh, way, but only in a half rhythm because Schoenberg's scale was double the size. 
uh, to find points and places of complete and eradicated absence. Absence that is so immeasurable that we cannot even see the absence. Uh, and if you want to know what that means, because that might sound like metaphysical, go to the Weizensee Jewish Cemetery where uh, you know, the Jews in, in Berlin thought that they were there going to be there for eternities because they were very integrated to the society, assimilated, uh, involved in culture, involved in, in, in economics, in, in, in business, in arts, in, in politics. Completely, they thought their future really was there. So in the Weizensee Cemetery, most of it is built for eternal future generations to be inscribed on these blank marble slabs. And that's the immeasurability of the immeasurable, because when I went there, uh, I realized there's no one to read this fact that it's empty. There is no one remaining from these families, you know, of the Rathenaus, of the Weisbrots, of the, of the Liebermans, of the famous families, to see the absence in the stone portrayed as a kind of testament uh, which cannot have any witnesses. So that's another thing I want to say about the remoteness and, and and of course, one needs a technique, uh, also a kind of uh, uh, acupuncture uh, of the mind to connect things that cannot really be uh, put together again because they are uh, across uh, a void. Like that line that I uh, found between Paul Salan, a poet of the Holocaust, uh, a Romanian who, uh, though he was French speaking and Yiddish speaking, uh, uh, wrote only in German. And, and uh, I found uh, Paul Salan in Berlin at Oranian. Strasse number one, and I connected it. So I made these couples, these uh, uh, names, uh, which were not points in the topography of an invisible city, but were also couples, uh, people, men and women, uh, who were connected across in a strange way. Uh, and they were intermarried also. Uh, not like the alchemical marriage of, uh, of sulfur and mercury, uh, not like the alchemical Renaissance ideas of abstract chemical bonding, but uh, the impossible marriage of Miss van der Rohe and Paul Salah, the impossible marriage of Rachel Varnhagen, who was a famous uh, Jewess who became a Protestant, who opened the Salon, uh, 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 creating the mythology of, of romantic German literature. And I connected her to Schleiermacher, the Protestant theologian who's buried next to the museum. So I found these points, these people and these figures, and I made it into this other figure, uh, which of course multiplies, uh, keeps multiplying in, in this topography uh, of the immeasurable. Uh, and yet, uh, it also gives an orientation, uh, because the orientation is wholly emblematic, since it does not exist uh, by looking at stars. Uh, the stars, like the addresses, uh, don't shine with any light that we can see. And uh, of course, you can see that uh, there is a, a light in an address. There is still Oranian Strasse number one, uh, and there is a light in it. There is a light on it. There is light in the housing project that has been put on. But, but it shines uh, with an absence of, 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 of a light as well. Like the stars uh, we know from physics, they are shining with a light long extinguished. We are only latecomers into the cosmic drama uh, so we see it not really as extinguished yet, although though we know it conceptually. That's what Einstein, I think, meant, uh, that the incomprehensible is already comprehensible. So that's the beginning. That's uh, what I would like to talk in connecting it to your theme, which is exploring the darkness, uh, men the measure, uh, and the immeasurable. Now, we know, uh, particularly in the 20th century, the attempt to measure the architect as the measure, the the, the, the dictator as the measure, the, the politician as the measure, who is going to measure the measure? And yet, uh, I think the true measure, if one thinks about it, is that which had no chance, that which had no future, and without being a pessimist, that which hardly leaves a trace, because according to Derrida, the trace itself doesn't really exist. Uh, there is the philosopher of deconstruction, one of the great minds, uh, interesting writers, but uh, when I asked them, you know, so what really is the trace? Uh, you know, because uh, we, we seem to say that it's something like a gone out ray of order or disorder. He said, well, the trace does not exist. Because what is the trace when it exists? It, it, it's not itself. And it's not a representation of something which was either. 
because it's sometimes a, repre as a representation of that which never was, never happened, never could happen, like these marriages. And of course, assimilation, integration is the problem of uh, Jews in Berlin, and that's also the mission of this museum. How across that total fatality, and uh, let's not uh, kid ourselves, the Holocaust is not a date in the history book, of course, uh, you know, it was long ago, uh, and, and we can dismiss it and put it as something uh, that is beyond in there. But I think it's also a reorienting moment, uh, which will come back. Uh, reorienting moment because those years in which humanity looked that deep uh, and saw that reflected in itself uh, is a guiding moment. And it's not, I think, by coincidence that Hiroshima and Nagasaki came immediately after from a different ideological perspective. But the opening was made uh, when, when it is possible to exterminate in a systematic way and uh, becomes acceptable uh, the city structure itself changes. Plans, uh, drawings, uh, relationship of, uh, of material to the city changes. And I ask really this question, when you are uh, architects, you will be drawing something, you will be making something. Uh, uh, what will you be making? What will we be making? Uh, and on what uh, basis? Uh, is it of the visible, of that which has left a trace? Is it of that uh, which never, uh, never existed? It existed only as this... Uh, kind of an impossible future which never was because it never had a past in itself. There was never such a moment as the integration of Jews in Berlin, despite all the facts that it happened. They were so close that they uh, changed their names to, to, to like a Liebeskind. Uh, that was, uh, I'm sure, well, I know my family came from that part too, from Hamburg and from Berlin. And, uh, and uh, well, I was born in Poland in a different time and a different uh, event, but, but still, I, I just ask that that moment of St. Augustine looking into the soul and not looking and not looking further into it is no longer <laughs> available to us. And now when we look at the darkness, when you look at the darkness, there is another sense of an echo. It's not the echo of those explorers of darkness, the first explorers of darkness. Who were they, the first explorers of darkness? I, I don't really know. I, I haven't studied this issue. But I, I would wonder, you know, who were the first explorers of darkness? Uh, well, they went sort of by centimeters for thousands of years, by little, and suddenly it was a big and decisive, irretrievable and irreversible movement. Uh, next, please. So uh, there was uh, the urban uh, plan, uh, uh, that, that plan of Berlin, which is a fascinating city. What, what an incredible city that is. A city of light, of darkness, a city of total transformation, of, of rising uh, from nothing again. Uh, and I ask myself, what does the name Berlin mean? Uh, what is in the name Berlin? I know it's only six letters, like the six points which I plotted. Which are the points? B-E-R-L-I-N, Berlin. I started, like, that's those the six points. You know, I spell it again and again. But what is in the name Berlin? Uh, what do we refer to when we say Berlin? Uh, who do we refer to? And back to basics. I think we refer to people, to names, to people who have left the name. Uh, people who have also have an address, uh, which uh, also needs to be addressed. An address that, as I said, as extinguished and as, uh, uh, as dark as it is, uh, still addresses us across time, across a different topography of the city. Uh, the inaudibility of that uh, music uh, that is played in that configuration is the third element of basics. And the fourth one is the opening up of dimensions of the city uh, through variety of texts, be they artistic, musical, uh, theological, philosophical, uh, alchemical, uh, magical, and any other thing that you might have on your mind. So those, I would say, are the basics. Uh, if, you, if you ask me, as an architect, as a person, you know, what do I think would be bringing uh, this thing to the basics, to the basic core, I would say those are the four dimensions. Now, I try to use those dimensions, of course, uh, myself, to, to, uh, to find a relationship in that kind of plan of a city. And it's not uh, a neat plan. It's, it's a plan that is disorienting. Uh, on one hand, you have the Baroque building, the new shape, which was built as the first courthouse of Berlin, uh, uh, the Collegium House, uh, the, the Kammergericht, a beautiful building from the 1760s, destroyed uh, completely and rebuilt in a, in, a, in a different way in the 1960s one aspect. Then we have the turn of the century fragments there on the bottom. Uh, is this 
something like a light, yes. Yes. Uh, these fragment buildings, which interesting enough are just coming down now. And they are uh, interesting 19th century buildings uh, standing there. And I was wondering, you know, what kind of planning Berlin has that they should uh, rip these buildings down? Wh wh what are they going to put there? Why, why are they in the way? But they're coming down. This one, at least. Uh, then we have the huge uh, projects. Oh, here, this uh, very important building, uh, the Mendelssohn, Eric Mendelssohn. What an incredible person. He was uh, exiled from Berlin. Uh, his building is standing here, the Metal Workers Building, the Union Building. Uh, it's also on the site, kind of, the bigger site. Uh, these huge housing estates built in the, well, I guess, 60s, uh, 70s, vast. They go all the way, all the way through Berlin and in the east also they were built at the same time. Uh, amazing kind of thing. And then there's the flower market and, and the new projects to the north, which are the big EBA projects. Herman's uh, project is very close there. So kind of the new Berlin of the, of the 80s. It's all together. And I don't believe that one could just... Uh, say, uh, of course one could. Yeah, they have lines and geometries and, and, and building volumes and programs, but yet when one looks at it, uh, one sees that it's a ghost. It, it, it's, 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 it's an invisible imprint of something that uh, cannot be retrieved by, I would say, bureaucratic or administrative methods of planning and thinking. Next one, please. So I put, uh, next one, please. Uh, I, uh, I, I looked at the site, uh, th there it is, looking towards the Kammergericht, the Berlin Museum. The site here is of, of the building, and uh, a very interesting, uh, uh, this here the wall still, the Alexanderplatz, all, all, everything beyond, and the interesting point in which Lindenstrasse was curved by the plan of Sharon away from the Schinkel plan in which this used to be. Next one, please. Uh, and from the competition, uh, model that that cipher uh, and and that idea of, of of the garden of the shards of of a building that looks like a single building but is many buildings uh, connected by a void and so on next one please and, and uh, there is the organization actually uh, from the outside there is the existing building the extension building of the museum and they, they are two separate buildings two big buildings standing uh, autonomously they are not connected by any bridge outside and I always say that th this makes this addition building from the outside the largest building without a doorway in a long time because it's big. It's uh, thousands of cubic meters of space. And they're, they're, I didn't want to put any bridge between them, but the bridge is underground through this kind of city, this other city, uh, uh, kind of a labyrinth of, of, uh, of what cannot be seen in plan because you're in it and you cannot never look down at it. And then throughout it runs this binding line which connects this bottom level and the volume of the building, which I call the void. A, a line, a straight disconnected line that runs uh, irretrievably and uh, gratuitously, so to speak, uh, throughout the project, cutting it, dissecting it, and also reaching the underground levels, showing in some way, as a museum space, uh, the light of the museum, but also the fact that there is no access through the light, that the light is uh, peripheral to the nature of the museum. And of course, what is this museum about? This museum is not a museum of art or a museum of, of something like that. It's a museum to try to show people who have no idea and uh, maybe very little interest what Berlin used to be like. Uh, not just in the you know, roaring 20s and 30s when, when we know Max Reinhardt and Albert Einstein and uh, Mendelssohn and all, all these modernist projects, but further in, in, in 1910, uh, the textile industry, the biggest textile industry, mostly uh, Jewish uh, you know, workers, uh, from Poland, uh, the, you know, and back into 1880s, 1870s, uh, the 17th century, 16th century, the Jewish community is very old. The first Jews came 12th century uh, to Berlin uh, and, and uh, established their community. So uh, the museum, uh, just for your information, is a museum that seeks to show the integration across an abyss. Because as I said, the Holocaust, it's not just something you can bridge over. No one can bridge over. No human being can bridge over uh, time, that time. No one, not even Eli Wiesel and witnesses, first-hand uh, survivors uh, of Auschwitz, they cannot uh, cross it. Uh, and we cannot cross it either. So we have to incorporate it somehow, incorporate the immeasurable, which, uh, to which man can give no measure, and not only to which man or woman can give no measure, but uh, to which uh, I would say God himself. Uh, cannot give a measure. Next one, please. 
So that's the museum from the outside as a fragment to give you the scale, a uh, piece of uh, detail, the, the wing. Uh, the Polsovanhof uh, here near the wing of the museum. And I, I used uh, these, these uh, names, not only as names, but as programs of the museum. And, and I have to say that very honestly that you know, it's not in the drawings, it's not in the models, it's, it's in other documents that I used. Uh, and I wouldn't call them hallucinatory, but, uh, but uh, they are spelled out in the building form. Next one, please. And uh, there is the view of the building, which will be clad in zinc. Uh, there's a model uh, standing next with its old independent structure. Uh, and uh, again, this is uh, zinc for the model, but I, I wanted to tell you that after time, this zinc becomes gray, and uh, it's actually one of my favorite colors in Berlin. Uh, I think those yellow and red buildings don't really work very well in Berlin. It's highly polychromatic buildings, because Berlin is basically an incredible beautiful gray and this Schinkel idea that I got actually from Schinkel who said you know use as much zinc as you can because it turns very beautiful gray uh, I, I used it uh, and, and I hope that uh, this will be when it's clad after some years because it doesn't happen right away although the zinc companies advise me to use a ready-made zinc that is already not changing but I tried to use the other kind of zinc which is more old-fashioned I guess which uh, stabilizes only after some years and is very uneven in its <laughs> In its, uh, in its outline because it depends where the wind is coming, snow, rain, it, it's kind of a covering. So uh, don't look at this really as an aesthetic statement of the sharp metallic building. It's going to be gray and, and bluish. Next one, please. That's the underground, uh, underground plan, uh, and it's a cutaway. You see a piece of the Kammergericht, the Berlin Museum, Baroque building, and uh, there's, uh, kind of the form disconnected here, but uh, you see the entrance, which is, uh, I built a, a, a part of the void, which runs throughout this museum, this empty space, this disconnected straight line, which has no access. Uh, parts of it are standing independently. One is the entrance and one is this tower. And then the underground uh, city, which is in the form of this triple X form. Uh, the triple X form I got from Schoenberg, Arnold Schoenberg, a Berliner, who lived right next to the site, who was a professor of music uh, in the Academy of Berlin, who was writing Moses and Aaron, the opera, which I think is one of the greatest. If, if you don't know it, uh, please listen to it. It's, it's one of the great works, I think. And he wrote only two, uh, two, two acts, right? Two first and second act. And then it's supposedly discontinued. He couldn't complete. Then he was kicked out of Berlin. He, he decided that he was, could not be a pro you know, he re he was a convert, a Jew, converted to Protestantism. And he was a Jew again, and uh, he left Berlin. And he left this uh, score unfinished. Uh, and the score is unfinished, and it's crossed out in this triple X form. Uh, not only graphically, but also technically and metaphysically in Schoenberg's idea of what the darkness is about. So I use this theme from Arnold Schoenberg. He's one of my guides, uh, because I would say you need a guide to darkness. Uh, and you cannot have Hermes or Persephone or, or any of those gods. I, I think it would be too difficult. And I look at Hölderlin, he said, you know, if only they would come back, but they're not coming back. So what guide can one, one use to the darkness? Uh, what kind of guide? Uh, it's not even the guide to the perplexed, the guide to the confused, uh, uh, but, but someone, uh, someone a she or a he or, 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 or somebody with a name. So I used this, this technique and, and here are the three roads that intersect in this particular way. One is a road uh, that leads to this garden, the square garden, uh, which I call the, the, the Ite Hoffman garden. Hoffman, the Prussian, the, the romantic poet who was a lawyer in this building and I was very moved to find out that one of my favorite writers was a lawyer in the building that I'm supposed to add an extension to. Uh, and E.T.A. Hoffman wrote uh, really the first, I think, deep analysis of the darkness uh, in, uh, in a kind of almost 20th century way. His stories uh, are guidebooks. He, he talks, uh, uh, read The Corner Window, a story called The Corner Window, in which he describes that all that is left, uh, and it, it is enough, is look out of the corner window at this site. So I looked at Hoffman and I dedicated his garden of exile. It's a, gar a garden of exile emigration. Not only the emigration of Jews 
uh, who are no longer just in Berlin anymore. They are in Jerusalem or New York or Australia, whatever. But it's the exile of Berlin from itself. That's part of, uh, it's not only a city as a uh, context for exile, but a city, and it's not, uh, Berlin is mysterious, as a producer of exile. So th that's one of the roads. The second road that intersects it at the sharp angle leading to the Holocaust Tower is the road of the, I would say, the apocalyptic end of a city. Berlin has come to an end. The, the name Berlin remains, but what we have known about Berlin is over. It's a different Berlin. It's a new Berlin. So this road leads to that, that uh, tower, which has a very sharp angle, has one truly vertical window, which is the longest window in the museum. And uh, that's all, it's empty, and, and it's that road intersecting. And then the long uh, road here, which leads to the main staircase, is the main circulation continuity to the collections and spaces of the museum up above. And that's the, uh, that uh, kind of a lobby, I would say, uh, of introducing the visitors to this triple uh, structure of Berlin. And, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's open, it's, it's, it's not, uh, uh, because the floor is also sloping, uh, it's not that easy as it looks in plan. It, it's more complex because the whole slope of the floor leans towards the void, uh, which is, goes in opposite direction to the movement of people and the kinetic <laughs> movement of the body. Next one, please. Uh, here it is in, in a model form, how you would see it when you come down to that underground. Uh, and you're standing somewhere here and you're seeing uh, this road leading to the tower, which will be somewhere here. This road leading to the garden, which doesn't really look like much of a garden yet. Uh, and it doesn't really look from here when you're on the ground. And this road, uh, can you focus please? Uh, this road here, which leads to this stair, which is the main stair, but it's cut off uh, in a way that uh, makes it look like a pretty unimportant stair. So that's the structure of, of the visitors. And I hope uh, that it will be interesting because th th there are different collections. Co Connections here also to the history of Berlin, because this is where the visitor will be introduced to the Kammergericht, right? The courthouse up above will have the history, introducing the history of, of the Enlightenment, right? Uh, when it was built. <coughs> then you go underground and you discover uh, the Enlightenment, but the Enlightenment without the light. Uh, and you discover what happens to, to the forces of Moses Mendelssohn, to the integration of Jews uh, in the city. Uh, you kind of discover this, this complex thing which is not a story which is over, by the way. It's not something, that's why I said, we cannot just say something is over in history. As, as Faulkner said, uh, history is, uh, uh, the past is not over. I, I remember this from Faulkner. He said the past is not over. Whatever he meant by that, but it means it can never be over. Uh, so uh, the history of the darkness, I, I, I really want uh, to, to make this point to you as architects are involved now creatively in this thing, uh, it, it, it's not a, the problem of nature, it's also the problem of history. Uh, because uh, in the story of, of, of Paradise Lost, uh, we know that, that only too late did Adam and Eve discover uh, what they had. So from the very beginning, uh, the notion that the snake was faithful to carrying out his orders, that the, that the snake was reliable, right, in the garden, is part of the idea of how is uh, the seeming ahistorical nature of, na uh, uh, ahistory of nature. And often people say, well, you know, you can plot these points in Berlin, sure, it's overloaded, it's, 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 it's overfed with history, but, you know, to just go to the Arctic. But I've been there too, and uh, the points are there, they, they more obviously even. You can see it in, in each wave, if you could memorize uh, what it was doing, uh, uh, you could see it, you could see it. So please, the, 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 the idea that nature is just something given like this is not true. Uh, certainly not the city, nature of the city, but also not custom, since custom and nature are intertwined. And you are, well, we are born to something which we believe is natural, but uh, little do we know that it's only a second custom. <laughs> Uh, and that our custom is a kind of nature, too. Uh, it's not uh, something that we uh, are that much aware of. So how to become aware? Next one, please. Uh, okay, underground, uh, in the museum, uh, in the Jewish museum, underground, uh, in one of those spaces that, that uh, uh, was 
cut off from the main form, you would find this uh, part, a kind of a wedge. And here is the void. And what is the void is the space that here continues all the way up, 22 meters high building, and goes across. But you can never see it completely across. You can see the first two voids, then the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth, and so on, uh, in a kind of sequence which doesn't add up to the simplicity of a line in concept. And uh, that is part of the kind of magic of uh, what architecture does, which cannot really be explained in any words. Uh, and I have to say, uh, people often ask me, you know, is it exactly like what you say? Please, uh, forget what I'm saying uh, when you're in the building, because uh, words cannot really uh, be held responsible for architectural space. Architecture has to support itself and has to be convincing on its own right. Next one, please. Uh, but anyway, that's part of the thinking of generating. There is the void uh, with its bridges across. And there are 60 of these bridges. And the 60 bridges are uh, really meant to be stations on this apocalyptic road of what is the name Berlin referring to, written by a particular Berlin, Berliner, the Berliner to me, Walter Benjamin. Because he wrote the Einbahnstrasse, the one-way street, the 60 stations, breathlessly, run, you know, the breathlessness uh, yeah, of, of Berlin. And, and I say breathlessness, but in the full sense of what it means to be breathless. Uh, the breathlessness of the one-way street, how to open it up, and how to denote these 60 positions in the distorted Star of David. That's what I wanted to do. So there are 60 stations which intersect in section and in plan with these outward lying positions of the star, which of course can never be uh, reduced to its uh, uh, six points or 12 points or 12 lines. Uh, there's the stair. There is the garden, there is the old building, the, the Kammergericht, the old uh, museum, and there are the roads intersecting, and one can see the, the basic volumetric structure of the underground foundation for the building. Next one, please. And here is a, 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 a picture which, which no visitor ever will see, because it's a kind of cutaway model for, for architects, I guess, or for builders, but uh, no one will ever see such a view, because this shows that inaccessible void, it shows the positions of the bridges, and shows the relationship to the Holocaust Tower, to the garden, and to the main stair, and to the underground place, which shows the enlightenment and all these things. Next one, please. And uh, here in, uh, in, in construction, uh, it's a kind of an underground, like uh, constructing like an underground thing. It's deep, because at the point of where this building intersects with this underground, it's, uh, it's very deep, because you have to go deep down. And Berlin is made out of sand. It's a beautiful city. It's full of water and sand. It's, I don't know how and uh, so well, but, uh, but uh, it's, it's truly fantastic. Uh, Berlin, everywhere you, you are really on something very uh, extensive, uh, extensively thin, that continues all the way to Russia and Poland. And, and to so th that's the underground. I was very much, uh, I thought it was very important. I know it's more expensive to make a connection like this. Uh, I knew it in the competition, but I thought it was very important that that one enter uh, the history of Berlin uh, like that, like an underground uh, passage. Next one, please. And uh, here you see the garden, the E.T. Alma garden, which has these uh, 48 plus one columns, uh, denoting uh, one more than the foundation of the state of Israel. Uh, one more column, one hollow column, but also this whole garden is, is uh, not a normal one. Next one, please. Uh, I say it's not a normal one because First of all, it's completely made out of concrete. You know, it's very hard, the surface. It's pebbles, very hard. And these things are huge uh, pillars containing earth. And, and the vegetation grows out of this earth onto this plane. Uh, I hope it works, but I, I'm working with uh, Mueller, Clifton, and Ve uh, Weber, uh, who are very good landscape architects. And they assured me that something surely will grow out of this uh, <laughs> eight meter column. Something will come out of it. Because it's tilted towards the light and, and things grow, uh, they will grow. So it, it will, it's part of this exile. There, there is uh, uh, the, that, that uh, underground uh, passage, and there's the other one leading to the tower, which you see here being constructed. Next one, please. And uh, in the earlier uh, uh, phase, I just want to show the illusory nature of that building in model form, because you can see that it's all these uh, thin, four thin walls running through the building. Next one, please. And uh, particularly in the beginning of the construction, one can see 
uh, the hollowness of it and the thinness of it. That, that's looking from the east towards the west, towards the back of the, of the Berlin Museum. Uh, and of course, all of this is then hidden in the construction. Next one, please, because when the building is finished, it's, it's, you can see that it's being closed off here. Uh, so no one can see the structure of the internal planning of the museum, uh, except by being inside of it. And I thought that was the proper uh, analog for how to deal spatially with the history of Berlin. Because on the uh, one hand, Berlin history is as simple as, you know, uh, as those lines that you can find, very graphic and, and amazingly kind of going from light to darkness to blackness and back out again. But on the other hand, when you get into the history, when you get into the address and who that address is for and where is that address addressing, it breaks apart and, and you cannot really hold it together in, in a singular grasp. And, and that's the inter interior of the building. So it's kind of the history, the duplicity, and also the, the, the Rus, uh, Hegel, the famous historian of Berlin, uh, philosopher, said that history is a trick. He called it the Rus of history. That history is not at all what it appears to be. And I, I think so too. And not that I'm a Hegelian, but, but studying more closely these addresses and these names and these places, I think history is not a, a reliable guide to the time. And uh, that is, of course, a problem also for you uh, in, in the search uh, and exploration of darkness. What uh, kind of history, whose history uh, will be a reliable guide? And I refer back to the fact that I believe that cutting across this historical continuity, which is like a story for children with, with a maybe happy or unhappy ending, is something which has no historical equivalence and yet is part of uh, the game, the play. Next one, please. Here is the form of the building during construction, uh, about half its size. But clearly you see the, bar the, kind of the buried volumes which intersect and interlock, uh, and creating several different kinds of buildings uh, which uh, don't have a very easy uh, relationship uh, to an explicit knowledge uh, of uh, those places. Next one, please. And here is the construction of, of the walls which, uh, which well, sure it's problematic because I, I wanted to cut across and it's hard uh, in, in modern architecture to, to make cuts because everything falls down and you can't <coughs> hold it. But I, I was lucky to discuss this with Peter Rice, uh, the great engineer who passed away recently, uh, and, and to, to kind of try to get another structure which is kind of hybrid and it doesn't express really technically anything on its own. It's kind of helpless because it is always allied to these intermarriage lines running across Berlin. Next one, please. And uh, here is that volume uh, that I showed, the, uh, you know, what it looks like in volume. In the earliest, you can see these bridge connections here, very clearly, up here too, and the window, and the void, which runs uh, throughout uh, this building. And I have to say, what does it represent? It represents that which cannot really be shown in the museum. Uh, and what cannot be shown in the museum is very simple. The richness of the Jewish connection to Berlin cannot be shown in objective in objects, since of course you can show a menorah or you can show newspapers or books, but no object can hold that relationship. So uh, basically, there is a really in the central orienting line of history something which has no objectivity, no things to show, uh, just uh, the light, which is I said peripheral because it's falling in the center of the plan, but peripheral peripheral to the circulation system. Next one, please. Well, I've said too much, but you can see here what this window looks like from the inside. It's, it's a decisive, uh, uh, it's some sort of a decisive uh, light, light made graphic, light made into a, a figure, or, or into a letter form. Next one, please. And uh, surely the letter forms, uh, I, I mean letter, uh, like the letters of Berlin, but I don't mean just the, like the B and the R, the letters, but I mean the letters which those letters letter, right? The, the letters, not just postcards, but letters. Uh, I would say here uh, to Derrida that you know, the postcard might be the, the, the contemporary way, but the letter, what the letter does is more interesting. Next one, please. Uh, and there is uh, this lettered uh, uh, facade, uh, so to speak, with a void going in here from the back. So you, you can see that it, it slips in and then it penetrates from this angle this is on the eastern part, the back part of this building form. And, uh, well, the effort uh, surely uh, is, 
is a big responsibility to make these windows. Uh, and er Eric Schall is here who worked uh, in our office. Uh, you know, one has to be responsible to the budget and to the, you know, all the uh, tough laws of, 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 of window making to invent a window which is not a hole. And, and I have to say, we did invent a window which doesn't have a, any precedent. And it's hard to invent. I under understand how naive I was to try to invent a window because it's very, very difficult uh, technically. And uh, you know, now I, I think I'm becoming a more boring architect because I know more about windows. But when you're completely naive and you know nothing except the letters that are shown through the windows, then you sort of have the temerity to try to make sort of a window that isn't sort of, yeah, isn't uh, ordered uh, by anybody, is not ordered by any, uh, anybody at all. Next one, please. Uh, and there is uh, the bridge uh, in, the, in the museum. I should say that the bridges, these 60 stations, uh, 60 stations of the apocalypse, uh, which Walter Benjamin describes, uh, which are now opened in both ways because the bridges are always symmetrical. Uh, there's always a left and a right, are also st uh, those less structure elements. That they are actually many buildings, uh, six buildings standing, which are only later connected by this uh, very lightweight structure, which literally connects it into a one building. But you can see that it's not one building. Next one, please. And here in section, uh, it's a very, uh, you, here you can see very clearly section to the void with, with, with the bridges and section to the museum spaces. So you can see the separate buildings and the creation of a singular building through this. Next one, please. And uh, there it is in space. That's, that's the line of the void, which is running this way, right, and back there. And here is that kind of the left and right. And that is this uh, very repetitive, totally uh, monotonous element that runs through the building. Every time you get to it, you have the same left and right, the same symmetry of relationships. And uh, the left and right represents, of course, the left and right. Just you can go left or you can go right. That's all. Next one, please. And here uh, is th that bridge uh, windows. You can get, get the scale of, of the museum spaces uh, and, and what the feeling in terms of uh, scale is. Next one, please. And there is a section through, through the entrance, that sloping plane falling towards the void. The bridges here in section and the library, archives, uh, and other things, and, and the main stair, and then section to the Holocaust Tower here, and the windows. Next one, please. Uh, here is a, a, a view uh, up the stair. When you get up that, that small stair, uh, bracing, uh, and these skylights are not yet opened uh, in this photograph. There, there, there are these cut lines, and these cut lines here. Next one, please. Which connect this external wall to the body of the void. And uh, I have to say that this is taken from somewhere up high, looking down into this uh, underground <laughs> foundation. But I, I want to say something about this window, which, which uh, was very deliberate. Uh, it's very, very high up from down there. When you're down below, this looks like a very, very thin line, actually, in space. Hardly accessible. And you think it's sort of like a white line of light created by you know, nature a cut of light, but when you get up here, you can go still farther, and there is a point where your shoe is actually on this level, and you can go above the window with your feet. And uh, I thought that really represents the kinetic movement uh, of, uh, of the history, uh, w which is at once seen as a, as a distant white line in the sky, and on, you know, invisible almost, uh, light created by, by nothing, out ex nihilo, or by some tremendous force, and on the other hand, it is only really that thing which uh, allows you to see uh, uh, how dirty your shoe is when you get up there. And, and that's the, the range. I think that's the full range for the visitors to such a, a kaleidoscopic uh, cultural place because you know, Berlin history is not just Albert Einstein, as I said, and Schoenberg and Walter Benjamin and, and Max Lieberman and uh, Max Reinhardt, these famous, famous uh, Berliners, U Europeans, world figures, but it's also this anonymity of uh, what it all means in terms of everyday life. And uh, I tried to involve these other uh, figures. Uh, that's what I meant. Next one, please. And here it is. Uh, that's the line of light uh, going through. Uh, by the way, it's the reflection of the light, because you can't see the window that way. And, and there's the structure, these uh, ribs. Uh, next one, please. And I think uh, 
Here is uh, the construction earlier. How you can see how, how it's made. Next one, please. These, these four. And uh, uh, it's always very, very different uh, from, from the inside, sometimes perforated uh, to the point that it's kind of like a screen through which you see the city, sometimes very, very opaque with no windows at all. Next one, please. And uh, here's a view from uh, looking at that uh, main, that, li that, that line of, of, the stair, uh, of the stair that I showed before through one of the cuts uh, in the front of the building, uh, another <coughs> staircase. There are two main staircases, one at the tip of the building and one of, along the main street. Next one, please. Uh, a view of it, uh, which, uh, you know, doing construction, but I think it's pretty close to how it will look how it looks. Uh, that's what you see. Next one, please. And uh, there's from the outside before it's cladding, the, the garden. Next one, please. And that's towards the end of the void, the end of the building, where you can see it colliding and then uh, virtually parting company, so to speak, with the topography of Berlin altogether. So that's the intersection. Next one, please. And uh, there's the tip of the stair. Uh, which is another main circulation element between the two floors uh, of, you know, beginning in, in, I don't know, 1870 or the beginning of the Reich. And then uh, as you do the Rundgang as a visitor, you get to the second <coughs> level. And the second level is, you know, Weimar. Surprising things happen. And uh, here at the tip of the stair, you stand and you see the street. And that's what I wanted to do. I was lucky to be given permission by the city of Berlin uh, to, to do this because it uh, violates the street line. But uh, I thought it was incredibly interesting to see up uh, Mark Grafenstrasse, which is the Schinkel uh, Gendarme Markt, access towards this uh, Baroque building. And on the other hand, to look at the Sharoon plan of Berlin, which develops to the south of it, to see both parts of the city from a kind of observatory and to get the idea of all of it uh, physically, kinetically, because of course, it's not only for the mind, it has to be exciting for the visceral experience. Next one, please. And uh, here it is. Uh, next one, please. And uh, from the library uh, up above, I think you get this gliding, this feeling of, of, of the horizontal aspect of, of these cuts. Next one, please. And uh, here, yes, uh, I think archives. I don't remember where that is. Looking back, and then Berlin Museum is back there. Next one, please. And then uh, the wall of the Porcelain Hof that I showed from the model in the beginning. And uh, I think you, you want to get the kind of full scale and what these courtyards will be like, because they are also meant to be part of the experience. Going to courtyards, going through housing projects, going through the Blumen Market, going to, uh, also physically, uh, like a mnemonic device. And, and that's something uh, what I want to say. Uh, uh, the darkness requires memory. Uh, because after a while, in the darkness, you lose memory. Uh, so uh, how would one keep, uh, keep in the darkness, uh, be with the darkness, uh, but not be part of it? Wouldn't that be a, 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 a something to investigate? Next one, please. And here is a museum space, one of them. But they're not all like that. They're, very, they're, they're varied, uh, and they are wildly varied because they deal with widely different aspects of that spectrum of what happened in the city and what happened to Jews and how this integrated and disintegrated and reintegrated history works itself out uh, in the future, not only in the past. Next one, please. And uh, the void, uh, one, one of the voids, you can see it's here, it's the, 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 those vertical windows. Next one, please. And, and another one, the, another view of it. It's very tall, it's, it's full, the full height. Next one, please. And here is the building uh, which, which unwinds, and it, it has a labyrinth-like uh, structure with this line across it here. You can see there's trees on Lindenstrasse, and here it's still pretty clear. Next one, please. And the tip of the building that I described earlier, the building going up high here, Berlin Museum is on this side. Next one, please. And uh, next one, please. The garden, these columns. Next one, please. The tower, the Holocaust Tower, the, the fragment of the museum. I only want to say that uh, from the street views, uh, it's just a group of buildings. And one would never know, uh, really, that it's a continuous building. And I thought that was really part of, 
of Kreuzberg. Uh, it, it wasn't ever this tabula rasa of, of uh, looking from above. It was, uh, it was this uh, very small movement uh, of, the, of the foot and hand and eye, uh, seeing these little places to find one's way around. Next one, please. And uh, there it is from, from the uh, Mendelssohn perspective. This is from the metal workers building, which opens in that inverted V form, A, a form, uh, towards this garden. Next one, please. And uh, at an earlier stage, where one could still uh, make a view that no one will ever see, <laughs> sort of, uh, from the airplane or uh, sort of x-ray photo for photography. Next one, please. Uh, and I end here where, where I really began, uh, because I, I began uh, with the name Berlin. And, and I w really was fascinated that, that um, it was the most popular name. Uh, for Jews to, to, you know, they came from somewhere to Berlin, they would change their name to Berlin. Uh, and Berliner was another very popular, thousands. And Schiller was a very popular name. That, that, and this uh, transformation of a name, the, uh, starting with the name Berlin, and the name's Berlin, because it's not one. Uh, okay, thank you.